Okay, we're about ready to get started. Good morning. We're about to get started with our final academic session, session four. It will focus on the 20th century Mississippi history. We have four presenters who will be discussing this topic. The first presenter is Casey Mosley, who is a PhD student in history at Mississippi State University. She has taught Mississippi history, among other courses, and previously worked at the Eudora Welty House and Garden. Today she will talk about the three-foot building in Meridian, Mississippi. The second presenter, Micah, Micah Reber, okay, is Associate Professor of History at Mississippi Valley State University, where he has taught for more than 10 years. He has written on a variety of topics, but his emphasis is on agricultural and technological history. His topic today is Time Bomb in a River, Oxford, Natchez, and two million pounds of liquid chlorine. Michael Tobin is our third presenter. He is a scientist in the agricultural industry at Crop Health Laboratories in Baltimore, Maryland. But he's also an enthusiastic amateur student of Mississippi history. His topic is racial violence along the Mobile and Ohio Railroad in the late 19th and early 20th century. Then we have Kate Gregory, who is an assistant professor and director of Mississippi Political Collections at the Mississippi State University Library. She oversees the archives of Senator John C. Stennis, Congressman Sonny Montgomery, Congressman David Bowen, and many others. Today she is going to talk about the civil rights papers of Judge William C. Keaty, who was a federal judge in the Northern District of Mississippi in the 1970s and 1980s. We will begin with Ms. Mosley. Check. Just give them a second, they'll get your volume up. Okay, they'll get my volume up in a minute. Is it good? Okay, awesome. Good morning, After what is it? Morning still, everybody. <laughs> um, I was not here yesterday for the conference because I had to work yesterday and then drive through a storm this morning to get here, so here I am. Um, it's better than the last time I presented, though. The last time I presented at the Mississippi History Conference was early March of 2020. So hopefully we don't have a repeat of that. Um, so my name is Casey Mosley. Uh, like he said, I've kind of had a long wandering sort of, but not really, career um, from teaching uh, graduate school at state and then I was a high school teacher and then I've worked in museums now. So I've gotten more interested in local history and historic preservation and restoration and what it means for the community that's in it. Um, so this is actually the first presentation I'm doing based off of my dissertation that I'm working on to try to finish <laughs> and get done. So um, the Three Foot Building in Meridian, Mississippi. Have any of you ever been to, since it's opened into a hotel, have any of y'all stayed at the Three Foot Building? Okay, a few of you have. Um, how many of you have never heard of the Three Foot Building before? Okay, so now you're going to learn. It is the... Um, the icon of Meridian, Mississippi. I'm from Quitman, Mississippi, which is right outside, like a little bit south of Meridian. So I grew up seeing this building, but I grew up seeing it empty. So I'm gonna talk today about, we're gonna kind of start with what it is now, and then I'm gonna back up to how it was built and the very inopportune time that it was built in. So right now, um, I encourage all of you after we get done today to go to the Three Foot um, Hotel's website 
because they did a really good job of presenting the story of the building, and it shows you what it looks like today. So it's this beautiful, newly opened boutique hotel that's supposed to celebrate kind of the golden era of the 1920s and 1930s. It's got this really cool rooftop bar called the Boxcar because Meridian, as we'll talk about, was built on the rails. Um, it's got a local 601 restaurant at the bottom, suites at the top, Starbucks at the bottom. It's just amazing what they've turned this into, especially considering where it came from. So that's where I will start with where it came from. So this is what the building looked like before. <laughs> so let's go back. So this is it now. This is what it looked like before. Shortly before the grand opening um, of, in 2021 of the renovated three-foot building into a boutique Marriott Hotel in downtown Meridian, Mississippi, former Mayor Percy Bland penned an op-ed for the Meridian Star newspaper. He wrote that for years, quote, something was sorely missing. Our heart and our vibrance, that feature that makes a place come alive. Since the 1990s, the 16-story building had been vacant with plans ranging from demolition to restoration to complete renovation and efforts to do any of them falling short due to lack of support um, and or funding for that. Speaking of those fallow years, Bland wrote, it was, quote, a lemon, an eyesore, a dilapidated structure. It, did, it stood tall in the middle of downtown as both a reminder of what once was and what could be. And one can infer a reminder of what Meridian had become, which was, in his words, quote, an otherwise dying city. But today, he remarked, the three-foot hotel by Marriott stands tall overlooking the entire city of Meridian and letting all of her people once again know what once was and with teamwork and a shared vision of what could be. To Bland and to the people of Meridian and its surrounding areas, the three-foot building has and continues to stand as a symbol of the health of the city itself. Its renovation and reopening have restored um, what's called a vibrant scene to the downtown area and to the city itself. A little bit of an aside here, I currently work at the Mississippi Arts and Entertainment Experience Museum in downtown Meridian. So a lot of conversation has happened in Meridian in recent years about this arts revival that we're having in downtown um, and this economic revival. The Riley Center MSU has completely redone over the past several years. Um, the Opera House has been redone. Now this building, the museum was built where I work. We have a children's museum now, and they're really starting to try to renovate and restore the Temple Theater. So there's a lot going on in downtown. And people have latched on to the three-foot building as a symbol of that we're going somewhere. Okay, so let's back up just a second <laughs> to the 1860s um, to talk about where, Ms., uh, where Meridian is in reference to the state and how it got started. So he showed me where a pointer is. Okay, so Meridian is, my hand's shaking, is here. So we're here. Meridian's here. The city of Meridian was incorporated in 1860 along the intersection of east to west and north to south rail lines. So a very great spot to try to build a city. Meridian saw substantial destruction during the Civil War, true, but it sprang back quickly thereafter and the city's population significantly grew within the decades to follow because of where it was. The Jewish community in Meridian was instrumental in both the city and the county's establishment and growth. John Robert Smith, who served as Meridian's mayor between 1993 and 2009, remarked, quote, Meridian was born of the railroads, but it was the great cultured Jewish mercantile families, mostly immigrants from Germany, who raised it up and breathed life into it. In the early to mid-19th century, many Jews left the growing anti-Semitism in Europe and settled in the United States. The Jewish contribution to Meridian cannot be overstated. Local historian Jack Shank wrote, quote, at no time in Meridian's history has its Jewish population numbered as much as 1,000. Even so, Jewish merchants and entrepreneurs of all descriptions have played a major role in the life of this city since its very early days. One of the most locally famous of these businessmen was Abraham Dreyfus, and he's seated in the middle there with his family. 
Dreyfus hailed from Germany and came to America at a young age, first to Jasper County, then to Marion, which is very, it's like kind of almost a suburb of Meridian if you considered we have suburbs, which we don't, um, and next to Meridian, where he started a shoe, as a shoe cobbler and eventually opened a general store selling leather goods, groceries, and other items. Now, there are some who believe that Dreyfus changed his last name to Threefoot to Anglicanize himself, to kind of lose this German and this Jewish identity and be more American. But given the robust Jewish community that was already in the area at his time, his devotion to his local Beth Israel synagogue, and the family's continued acknowledgement of their German roots, the generally accepted reasoning for that as being an Anglicanization wasn't holding true. Um, mostly, the family just changed their name from Dreyfus to Three Foot because the German Dreyfus translates to three feet. So they're the Three Foot family. By the time of his death in 1898, Abraham Three Foot had established himself as one of Meridian's most beloved men and one of the grandest men in the state. Even without Abraham, the three-foot name continued to have impressive sway in the area for the next several decades through his sons and their sons who ran the Three-Foot Brothers Company, as you see on the other side, um, and were, they were all very active in civic life in their religious community. They served on school boards and just were very active in the area. So let's get to the 1920s when the building starts to come about. In the 1920s, newspaper articles espoused the favorable conditions for businesses uh, in the city and encouraged people to come live and work in upcoming Meridian. The city's population continued to increase into the early decades of the 20th century. The growth was seen by locals as a selling point to bring in even more people and, more importantly, businesses. As we know in tourism and city development, you gotta have businesses so people have places to work, so people have money to spend in your business, in your uh, area. So the hope was that this would further boost Meridian standing in the state and region and solidify it as an economic force in the Southeast. And yes, Meridianites were and still are a little obsessed with competing with Jackson. So. This was in an editorial column in the Meridian Star in 1929. And she says, there is no lovelier, dearer spot, Meridian, Meridian, that we should choose to cast our lot, Meridian, Meridian. We love thee for thy scenery, thy civic pride and industry. Of all thy virtues, proud we are, Meridian, Meridian. So, riding this wave of enthusiasm and optimism, Lewis and L.M. Threefoot, so these are Abraham's grandsons, organized the Threefoot Realty Company in the spring of 1929. Sit with that time period for a second. <laughs> Along with other um, prominent people within the community like Irving Rothenberg, F.J. Hughes, E.A. Morrison, S.S. Marks, and Paul Chambers, and started planning the construction of a 15-story modern office building to be built in downtown Meridian. The papers reported that the building would be, quote, a handsome pressed brick, steel and concrete fireproof structure with space for upwards of 250 offices and would offer every comfort and convenience to the office users, users including three elevators that would operate day and night and window access for each office guaranteeing air and light. This impressive Art Deco style building came with a hefty price tag a projected $750,000. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, this would be around $13.1 million today. So they were going to spend a lot. In an effort to deflect any naysayers about the projected cost or the need of an office building this large at all, the Meridian Star reported that the office building experts have made a thorough check of the Meridian office situation and declare that the new building is an assured success for the investment standpoint. Lewis and LM Threefoot themselves assured the public that sufficient space had already been spoken for uh, to ensure a profitable occupancy with long time leases and that things had progressed to a point which assured the erection and completion of the Threefoot building. Construction began in June of 1929 and the building was projected to be opened for business in March the following year. 
By all accounts, the local and national economy seem to be thriving, providing an exciting moment for the three-foot building to define the Meridian skyline. Article after article praised the growing economy, with one predicting that the third quarter of 1929 would be unusually favorable and declaring that Meridian was one of the three most prosperous cities in Central Dixie. Now, it's easy to look back and be like, oh, bless their hearts, they didn't know. But you remember how I said I presented in March of 2020 the last time? Bless our hearts, we didn't know. As the building rose downtown, so did excitement. One citizen noted, we used to look down at the three-foot building in the making. We're going to have stiff necks looking up from now on. An article in the Meridian News Review paper raved, the splendid headway being made on the new building gives 22nd Avenue looking north a new prosperous appearance. It gives an inkling of what the new building will mean to Meridian by the time March rolls around. For all involved, the three-foot building meant excitement, progress, glamour, stability, growth. It was meant to be something that Meridianites could be proud of and feel proud in. It would give the city another push in the direction of being this marked, stable, you know, stable economic force in the South and drawing more and more businesses and people to the building. But as we know, because hindsight, um, things changed. In October of 1929, only a month after the, quote, splendid headway of the building had been praised, the Meridian Star's front page announces this. Stock value drops billions. Throughout the next few months, Meridianites were assured, though, that the economy was on the mint, with headlines constantly trying to encourage its readers, assuage their fears, and lift their spirits, not just for the building, but for the economy as a whole. As the nation pressed into 1930 with as much optimism as it could muster, construction on the three-foot building did continue. In fact, the construction manager projected that it would be completed before the contracted time of March 15th. He also assured readers that the building was being rented rapidly, although it is highly probable that most of those renters had secured their contracts prior to the economic problems. Hopes were high that the three-foot building would draw more national attention to the city and to the South itself. The hope was that it would be a symbol to encourage Meridianites, Mississippians, and Americans that the economy would continue to be and be strong and grow just like the building was. It seems clear, however, that whatever hopes Meridianites had in Meridian and the three-foot building faded behind national and international concerns into 1930. Despite these assurances of government officials and the press that things were fine, people wondered if that was true. It's also noticeable that while the building had garnered front page coverage, large pictures, excitement, In its planning and construction stages, articles on the building slowed during the later half of the 1929 year, and there was no front page article or sizable article at all that I could find that announced the building opening in the spring of 1930. Though little fanfare was given to the opening of the three-foot building in early 1930, it did receive some attention from regional newspapers and an international presence in the years that followed. Newspaper readers all over the world were introduced to Meridian, Mississippi and its skyline defining structure in a July 1933 feature in Ripley's Believe It or Not cartoon. The three foot building is the tallest building in Meridian, Mississippi, it proclaimed. And there we are. But that's all they said. However, The three-foot family suffered from plummeting sales and the inability to uh, fill its rental spaces in that building during the Depression. By 1937, only seven years after it opened, the three-foot realty company was forced to sell the building at auction to the Bondholders Protective Committee for only two-fifths of what it was worth at the time. And the three-foot brothers uh, company and a lot of the other... uh, General stores and businesses were struggling as well. In the years that followed, the building would be bought and sold a number of more times, um, which I'll get into more in my dissertation itself. I'm giving an overview. But it stood for many, many years, though, as a deteriorating structure, mostly vacant. There were things like dentist offices and 
um, tax companies and things that kind of rented parts of the building, but it never reached what they thought it would. Discussions went on for years about whether to restore it or just demolish it altogether. Dee Dee and I were just talking about how we were so glad that that didn't happen, but it came really close to just being demolished. Plans were made to rehab it and then fell through time and time again, but still it stood. This symbol of modernity and economic progress and success that Meridian almost had, but didn't quite get. The three-foot building was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1979. It housed many offices and businesses until the 1970s when the city's first mall was built. And that's when we start to see businesses moving, not just in Meridian, but kind of all over, businesses moving from outside of downtown to the suburbs and along the interstates. The 1990s found the building mostly abandoned and the building officially closed in 2000. It was listed on the National Trust for Historic Places, um, excuse me, the National Trust for Historic Preservation's 2010 list of America's 11 most endangered places. And then the Three Foot Preservation Society seen here was founded by locals in 2013 with a mission to ensure that the building was saved from demolition because there was a lot of conversation, especially with the mayors and the city council at the time about it's taking up so much space, it will take too much money to rehab it anyway, we need to just get rid of it. So this uh, community organization, they held community cleanup days, they even threw a birthday party for the building, they tirelessly sought funds and support for a project to keep it from going away. What excited Meridianites was every time things were announced that someone had bought the building and they were gonna do something great with it, they would then come in or they were thinking about buying the building, they'd come in, take three looks at it and leave. <laughs> um, but, so when this was announced, people were like, okay, yeah, it's gonna be a hotel. But it happened. The Meridian Star reported the restoration and renovation as follows. So I'm gonna give a large quote from the Meridian Star. The Meridian City Council approved the final agreement for the sale of the building to Ascent Hospitality Management Company in October of 2015. In the following five years, the building underwent a comprehensive renovation. Many of its features were preserved, including, including the mosaic work of the exterior, the elevator lobby's marble wainscoting, flooring, mail chute, and the original Art Deco light fixtures. Guests are welcomed into two vestibules that feature original 1929 Victorian era brass lanterns with frosted and cranberry glass accents. The registration desk displays restored wood doors and hardwood from the office doors reclaimed from the Three Foot's former life. In collaboration with the Three Foot Historical Society, the building's original office directory board is being updated with the names of the building's former tenants. The ground floor elevator features the original ornate brass etched doors, which were polished during renovation and brought back to their original glory. It really is a beautiful thing to behold. That was my addition at the end there. So the building is exciting, but my whole point in studying the building is it's not just the building. The three foot name is now synonymous with Meridian in a lot of ways. And the building silhouette remains part of all of our marketing <laughs> in a lot of ways as well. The Three Foot Festival, the Three Foot Arts Festival started in 2002 and continues year after year. Lots of um, vendors coming, musicians, and it's a really big celebration of the city. The Three Foot Brewing Company, a local brewery, opened in 2021, and they have many locally brewed beers, and one of them, I believe, is called the Dreyfus. Um, so, or I, I believe so. Um, so this three foot name is still there. And actually, a funny aside here, um, I went into C Spire last month to ask something about my cell phone plan, which is always fun. And the gentleman that was helping me was in Meridian and he had a Meridian tattoo all over his arm. And it had the three foot building on his arm with Meridian 601, okay? That's our area code, represent. So I just asked him, you know, real quick, I was like, is that the three-foot building? I mean, I knew it was. And he's like, oh, yeah, I should have asked him more, but I was irritated about my phone plan. But 
It's in the city and in our people, this building and what it means to us. So I'll close here. Um, and this is the boxcar restaurant at the top of the building. Gorgeous, beautiful space to be at. They have suites at the top um, and then hotel rooms all in the bottom. So I'll close, close with this quote that further proves that the building is more than just a building. It's a symbol of Meridian's economic health and our hope for the future. I say R because I am a Meridianite. Coleman Warner, the director of development at the Max where I work, actually wrote an article in which he said, quote, the three-foot building was Mississippi's first skyscraper. It's always been an architectural landmark. It's an important building. Now, to see it come back to life as an upscale hotel is sort of a once-in-a-generation opportunity for Meridian. The repercussions of this hotel project are going to be powerful. And we all hope he's right. <laughs> we'll see where that goes. Um, in the last second here, I did want to throw this in. So, as any old building, happens, uh, kind of local folklore gets attached to it as well. So there are quite a few ghost stories um, about the building. I was sitting, um, as I'm working on the three foot, you know, dissertation project and everything, I had gone to eat lunch at Weidman's. Any of y'all Weidman's fans? They're fried green tomatoes. Oh my God. Um, anyway, I was sitting there and this gentleman comes in. I'm there by myself at lunch, just having my lunch. and. One of the bartenders for the boxcar had come into the restaurant and was picking up something, so he was chatting with um, a visitor who was sitting there. And he starts to tell the guy about the three-foot building. He says, oh, yeah, the, uh, that three-foot building's haunted, you know, and I, my ears perk. I'm like, okay, what's he going to say? So he tells them, oh, yeah, you know, the, the patriarch of the family, they built the building, they lost all their money in the Depression. He shot himself inside the building. This huge, you know, and he haunts it even today. And I'm like, no. Anybody else who's like a historian that hears stuff like that and you're just like, oh, no. Um, but what happens is there have been three deaths in the building. I will say that, but none of them are that fancy. Um, one was a porter who he was waiting on the elevator and it opened and he thought it was there and it wasn't. And so he fell. So that was terrible. One was a lady um, who actually jumped from, I believe, the sixth floor. She was um, a mental patient who it wasn't to do with the building itself. And actually, oddly, so it may be uh, haunted, um, now that I think of it, the same day that that happened, another lady, completely unrelated, just collapsed in one of the drugstores at the bottom of the building with a heart attack, and she died. So there have been three deaths, but not the shooting of the matriarch. S.S. Marx, however, who was related to all of the families in Meridian um, and the Jewish families, he did shoot himself, but it was in the Emporium in Jackson. And not to do with losing money, he actually had a health problem that he knew was going to get worse. So um, he chose to do that. But that's where these folklore things get attached. There's also um, a short story, I forget the author's name, but she wrote about a, a little gypsy girl who jumped from the top of the building uh, or fell from the top of the building after the gypsy queen's um, funeral. People take that as fact, but it was a short story written for a fiction magazine. But it's in, what, the reason I like to, to I want to close on that is because this building for Meridianites and for the, the whole uh, around, it's more than just brick. It's something that we can kind of put our identities into and our, you know, ghost stories into, and it, it looms large for us, and we'll see what the future holds for Meridian. So thank you all for your attention, and uh, I'll be done. All right, let's go ahead and get going. Good morning. It's good to be here been a while since I've presented anywhere with all the pestilence and going on. We're going to talk about time bomb in a river. Oxford, Natchez, and two million pounds of liquid chlorine. Let's go ahead and bump forward here. You'll forgive my uh, not very good uh, fidelity up here between uh, lousy scans and rudimentary skills. This is what we get, but we'll, we'll make it through. On March 23, 1961, the towboat Eastern pushing 16 barges arranged in a 4x4 four four pattern, slowly made its way up the Mississippi River. The day was cool and clear with just a light breeze, and the water was reported as calm. 
As the vessel approached Mooreville, Louisiana, about seven miles south or downriver of Natchez, Mississippi, it encountered something, possibly a swift, curry or ed, a swift current or eddy, which caused the nose of the front left barge to dip below the surface. Now think about this. These barges are 200 feet long apiece, so four of them forward is three football fields away. It's a long way out there. As the barge took on water, the lashing cables which secured the barge to its neighbors snapped, and the barge and its cargo quickly sank beneath the river's surface. Uh, the loss of a vessel was unfortunate, but not uncommon. Hundreds of wrecks littered the bed of the Mississippi River. However, a few vessels pose as great a threat as this one, the barge, the YCAM-112, Wyandotte Chemical-112, that sank carried four huge cylinders, each approximately 75 feet long, 11 feet in di diameter, and containing 275 tons each of pressurized liquid chlorine. Uh, chlorine gas is quite toxic, having been used as a weapon in World War I, and the 2.2 million pounds sitting precariously on the bottom of the river amounted more to more than was used by all sides during the Great War. The captain of the rig immediately notified the uh, Corps of Engineers, who was in charge of these things, and the patrol boat Orleans quickly arrived on the scene. The engineers searched the areas but could find no trace of the lost barge in water that reached 75 feet at that time of year. Further searches over the following days failed to really reveal the location of the barge or the tanks. The U.S. Navy got involved, sending helicopters equipped with sonar gear used to detect submarines. They located a large metallic object in the approximate area, but divers were unable to check the location because the river was high at that time of year. When the river level dropped in September, drivers, divers again searched the area but could find no trace. They assumed it had been buried in the sandy bottom of the river, and in November of 1961, the Wyandotte Chemical Company, who owned the chlorine, called off search efforts and declared the cargo lost, a decision that, in their minds at least, absolved them from further responsibility. Um, this is not part of my talk, but it didn't. All right. By the summer of 1962, news of the potential disaster had reached the ears of President John F. Kennedy through Edward McDermott, the director of the Federal Office of Emergency Planning. McDermott informed the president of the situation, including predictions that, should the gas be released, the number of casualties might reach 80,000, with 40,000 fatalities. In the words of McDermott, quote, this had the potential of being the worst natural disaster in the history of the United States. Kennedy immediately told McDermott to, quote, do whatever has to be done. The Office of Emergency Planning sprang into action, moving quickly in the hopes that it could recover the tanks before the river levels began to rise in November. However, the story of what was potentially America's worst natural disaster has been largely forgotten, overshadowed even at the time by two other events. One of these involved the Magnolia State and shared numerous actors. The second would command the attention of not only the country, but the world. The first started in January 1961, approximately two months before the barge's disappearance, when a young Air Force veteran named James Meredith applied for admission to the University of Mississippi. In May of that year, after much foot dreading, Old Miss rejected the application, and Meredith, assisted by the NAACP, filed suit in federal court. At this point, Ole Miss and Operation Chlorine, as the project was called, intersected in the person of Governor Ross Barnett. And here we have Barnett and Kennedy in uh, happier days. Uh, I believe they are signed, it's Barnett on the R left, Kennedy on the right, and I think they had just signed some sort of uh, beneficial for Mississippi chicken legislation. So Ross is happy about this one. Uh, they reveal him, Barnett, to be an actor trying to play two roles. At the exact same time, Barnett made his public stands against the federal government. In private, he did all he could to wrangle every possible assistance and every last dollar from the feds to clean up the coring barge. As Office of uh, Emergency Planning Director Edward McDermott recalled, I went down to Mississippi at the president's request and had a rather interesting meeting with Governor Ross Barnett on the chlorine barge problem at practically the same time he was avoiding service of a federal summons. 
Quote continues, you had a tremendous resistance to the federal actions on the one hand and practically on their hands and knees asking for presidential and federal assistance on the other. Close quote. On September 7th, 1962, the Office of Emergency Planning assigned the task of raising and recovering the sunken chlorine tanks to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers while delegating to the U.S. Department of Health the responsibility of taking the steps necessary to protect and, if necessary, evacuate the populace of Natchez, the surrounding three counties of Mississippi, and three parishes of Louisiana. Colonel Warren S. Everett, commanding officer of the Vicksburg Engineering District, in which the wreck occurred, was given command of the salvage operation. His task force first job was to locate the wreck, and for this they turned to the U.S. Navy. Using their latest submarine detection aircraft, Navy pilots located a, quote, large iron mass sitting on the floor of the river near where the chlorine barge had disappeared. Ship-towed magnetic detection devices confirmed the location of the barge, of a large object, don't get ahead of ourselves, sitting on the riverbed covered with about three feet of sand and silt. Having established the object's location, the engineers brought in drilling gear mounted on barges that lowered hydraulic jets capable of blasting through the sand and mud on the river's floor. At this point, the engineers employed divers whose first job was to confirm that the object was, in fact, the missing barge. And they brought in R.S. McGuire, a diver who commanded the NASA team dedicated to recovering astronauts should their water landings go awry. He led the operation. Using a pneumatic hose, he cleared enough to debris to locate the working platform on the barge where he removed two valve handles and a pressure gauge. None of them connected to the chlorine tanks. Thank goodness which the Wyandotte Chem Chemical Company identified as coming from the sunken vessel. Having found the barge, divers carefully marked its location. Let's see. Sticky papers here. We'll explain what this is in a second. While the Corps of Engineers handled the salvage operations, the Department of Public Health took charge of efforts to safeguard the local population in case one or more of the tanks should rupture. This required the coordination of a wide range of federal, state, and local agencies. Dr. H.B. Cottrell, the director of the Public Health Services Atlantic Region, was tapped to lead these efforts, and they established their headquarters in Vidalia, Louisiana, just across the river bridge from Natchez. Dr. Cottrell and his team faced a daunting task in protecting the approximately 85,000 people who lived within a 30-mile radius of the submerged tanks, making the job more challenging, Natchez, by far the largest city in the area, set approximately seven miles away from the wreck in the direct path of prevailing winds. Meteorologists reported that the winds at that time averaged seven to ten miles an hour, meaning that if a tank were to rupture under normal conditions, it would take less than one hour for the airborne chlorine to reach town. Weather played another important factor because the tanks needed to be raised quickly by November 1st before the river levels typically started to rise. Experts determined that if one or more tanks did rupture, approximately 50,000 would be affected with estimated fatalities of between 10 and 25,000. Hmm. Though officials on the scene repeatedly assured the citizens of the area that the chances of a catastrophe were, quote, a million to one, their preparations demonstrated that they still considered the recovery a risky endeavor. In the earliest phase of the operation, the officials in charge leaned toward evacuating the entire area during the entire lifting process, but soon decided that they would not evacuate unless there was an actual emergency. They prepared plans to cover a wide variety of possible disaster scenarios and focused their primary efforts on four areas. One, they decided to evacuate the sick, elderly, invalid, and others who would require special assistance before the process and keep them evacuated until it was done. Second, they developed evacuation plans. Third, Army technicians would install air, purify, air, air purifiers and distribute gas masks to make sure that every citizen would have some sort of protection. Finally, and most morbidly, plans were put in place to deal with the cleanup, should disaster occur. In the middle of September, while the engineering crew worked to ready the tanks for lifting, those in charge of the health and safety of the area residents began assembling materials and putting emergency plans in place. Supplies started rolling in. Um, 19 C-119 cargo planes brought in 40,000 blankets from Army bases in Texas, 
while 15,000 cots and other supplies arrived by truck. The Public Health Service received an initial shipment of 20,000 gas masks and by the end of the month would have over 40,000 ready to distribute. The Red Cross brought additional materials and began the process of arranging necessary shelters should residents need to evacuate. Meanwhile, the engineers continued to remove mud and silt from the sunken barge, and here you can see some of the uh, equipment that they have assembled. It's enormous. In the process, they discovered that the barge had buckled in the middle. While there had been some talk about bringing up the whole barge with the tanks intact, the damage meant that the tanks would have to be raised individually. This had always been a possibility, but it meant a longer and more complicated recovery process. And I think, yes, not great, but here are two models, one with the barge intact, and you can see the, the broken, buckled barge there on the bottom. Hmm. Let's see. While this was going on, federal marshals had sequestered James Meredith in Memphis, waiting for President Kennedy to give them specific instructions. The Kennedy brothers had been trying for weeks to negotiate some sort of settlement with Gover Bar Governor Barnett that would avoid violence. Barnett, for his part, was acting increasingly desperate. He had, among other things, appointed himself registrar at Ole Miss and personally declined to register Meredith, all the while facing $10,000 a day in contempt fines. Conversations between Barnett and Meredith, bar, sorry, Barnett and the White House on more than one occasion, including discussion of both Meredith and the situation in Natchez. All right. On September 28th, members of the U.S. Army Chemical Corps team arrived from Arsenal, Maryland, to provide training in the use of gas masks. However, they might have been better used in Oxford, where violence erupted on, that ni on the night of September 30th. The riot that followed killed two, injured dozens, and left the Old Mess campus looking like a war zone. Again, Operation Chlorine and Ole Miss came together. When Kennedy called up the Mississippi National Guard to assist in Oxford, numerous detachments were already detailed in Natchez. Officials in Mississippi expressed concern that units needed in Natchez would be called away. They weren't. But it's unclear from the paper trail whether they feared more troops in Oxford or fewer personnel in Natchez. The following Monday, Meredith, now a registered student, attended his first classes. The same day, officials now had most of their plans in place. Invalids, hospital patients, and others who needed special assistance would be evacuated before the first tank would raised and would remain out of the area until the process was complete. Schools were equipped with air purifiers. They were also installed in hospitals, rest homes, and other designated sites. Positive pressure inhalers used to treat Victims exposed to chlorine gas were installed in local hospitals, and medical staff was trained in their use. The National Guard, in conjunction with the Mississippi Highway Patrol and area law enforcement, began planning the evacu evacuation routes, complete with personnel at key spots. The Red Cross prepared four mobile canteens to feed evacuees on the road. 87 colleges and schools in both Mississippi and Louisiana indicated they would be ready to receive evacuees. Now, through all this, there were uh, reporters, national reporters, down in Natchez covering all this until as most Americans followed the Cuba situation, Operation Chlorine continued as health officials finalized plans and announced them to the public. Evacuation plans were detailed in local newspapers and children in local schools prepared, participated in evacuation drills. In the event of evacuation, students black and white would go to the appropriate segregated schools in Brookhaven, Mississippi, located about 60 miles to the east. Other students would be transported to Vicksburg or Hazelhurst, where they would be sheltered until the danger had passed. On the 21st of October, officials began transporting invalids to hospitals across Louisiana and Mississippi. The National Guard, the Public Health Service, and law enforcement agencies all took a part in the effort and transported a total of 246 patients. Because of a shortage of ambulances in the segregated South, black funeral homes were called upon to use their hearses as impromptu ambulances to help move residents. Most white patients ended up at the Veterans Administration hospitals in Jackson, Biloxi, and Gulfport, while the majority of African Americans were transported to charity hospitals in Laurel, Vicksburg, and Meridian and the VA hospital in Shreveport. 
In addition, 40 mental health patients were transported to the Mississippi State Hospital near Brandon. All right, two days later, Coast Guard cruisers halted river traffic 30 miles up and downstream, and the Mississippi River Bridge at Natchez was closed to traffic. And on October 24, 1962, the first tank was raised without incident. The second followed two days later. The tanks proved to be in very good shape. Officials noted that they were free of dents, and even the paint had barely been scratched despite sitting on the bottom of the Mississippi River for over 18 months. Having removed the two upstream tanks, dredging crews required a week to remove the silt and debris that had collected around the, downtown, the downstream tanks. The process went smoothly, and engineers raised the third tank on November 2nd, the fourth tank on the 5th. The entire lifting process went according to plan, save for two short delays caused by shifting sands. The danger averted, it remained only to clean up and head home. Red Cross workers moved on to their next assignments while National Guard units were released from duty. Engineers dismantled the derricks and other lifting apparatus while the Army collected the air purifiers they had installed. Residents were reminded they needed to return their gas masks, and the invalids were transported back from their temporary homes. One fatality occurred. Miss Annie Barnes, a medical evacuee, descri evacuee described as, quote, 72 years, colored female, died from uremia at the VA hospital in Shreveport. Here we have, on their way home. And that should have been that, but it wasn't. There remained the question of who's going to pay the cost of the cleanup. Even before the engineers removed the first tank, Ross Barnett sent letters to the White House to ascertain whether the federal government would pick up the costs. The stream of letters continued after the last tank had been removed. Perhaps the most prolific collection agent was Senator John C. Stennis, who despite having proudly signed the segregationist Southern Manifesto, rejecting the federal government's authority to enforce integration, pestered both the White House and the Office of Emergency Planning with a series of letters reminding them that they had promised to pay and making sure the appropriate funds were forthcoming. And that neatly illustrates the genus-faced genus -faced nature of not only Governor Barnett and Senator Stennis, but many others of their ilk. Politicians ready to publicly defy the federal government when it served their purposes, and equally ready to not just accept, but actively solicit federal funds. Operation Chlorine neatly demonstrates which they thought more important, as Barnett clearly showed through his public, sorry, his political machinations that he was more concerned with what he saw as a way of life rather than the actual lives of tens of thousands of citizens of Mississippi. So that's what we have for today.